Well, hello there. I'm Ingvar Johansson. Uh, I come from Iceland and I'm a chess master. In this video, we will review episode two. And this will not be like uh, normal reviews of shows. I will only focus on the chess scenes, more or less. We're going to look at the, uh, you know, chess positions and, uh, you know, see where they come from and uh, how realistic they are. And maybe we'll find some errors, but let's get into it. We start the episode with young Beth, and I want to mention this because she talks about uh, learning the Sicilian. This is what she has to do, she's being punished, she can't play against Mr. Scheibel anymore. So she says, uh, pawn to queen, uh, bishop 4. And this is descriptive notation, as you can see here uh, from an old book. And this was used uh, at the time. So a few years go by, and we don't really have a chess scene until Beth gets adopted. Uh, she goes to the library and finds the book about Jose Raul Capablanca, the uh, third world champion. He was referred to as a grandmaster by the librarian, which is uh, factually, uh, well, you can debate both ways, but he was a grandmaster and world champion. The next glimpse of chess is the magazine Chess Review. We also get a glimpse of the timeline. We see Kennedy there with uh, Ich bin ein Berliner, a famous uh, quote. From 1963, so that's where we are. And Chess Review is indeed a real uh, magazine, and later it merged with Chess Live and became Chess Live and Review, and uh, I believe it's still still published. We see some uh, pages from the magazine. We saw Hans Kmoch, uh, a classic book reviewed there earlier. Then we have a cover, but that is of a character from this particular series. And well, she starts to use the magazine to visualize. But then she sees there's a tournament, and well, good old Scheibel, he sends her the five bucks to enter the Kentucky State Championship. As she uh, enters the tournament, she is introduced to the clock sharing system. This is an actual thing, especially in the USA. People often show up with their own clocks and own boards are required to do so, and often there are arguments about which set to use. This is not the case in Europe. Uh, but this seems accurate. She uh, convinces them to enter the, the main section of the tournament. They want her to enter uh, the under 1600 as she is unrated. But okay, she gets into the main tournament. The pairings are put up on the wall. This is still normal today. Uh, and it was more so back in the day. Now you can put things online. She gets her first match and is introduced to a chess clock. Back in the day, your flag would fall uh, when the clock reached six o'clock, if I recall correctly. These days you have a, a digital clock, so this is where flagging comes from. Your flag actually falls. Funnily enough, after teaching her about the clock, she forgets to push the clock herself. Beth wins the game rather quickly and walks around the playing hall and we see people smoking. And this used to be a thing, it was a big thing, unfortunately, back in the day, people would just puff smoke all over you. Unfortunately, we have uh, different times today. She goes to check out the top boards, which are sealed off, which is also a thing. You know, the lower boards are kind of a gulag down there and you go to the top boards to see the top guys. And we see the villain of the episode, uh, Beltic. Time for a pet peeve. The way he captures is really amateurish. You will not see top players capture like this. You will see them pick up the piece and then move the piece to the, to the square or pick it up in one fluid motion like we just showed there. He also presses the clock with a piece, which is also very amateurish and no people would do that today. While uh, observing the game, they speak rather loudly and Beltic uh, tells them to shut it. And this is something you would see today. People shushing with a loud shush. Usually people that are losing, but not in this case. Then we have a rather silly moment. Uh, Beltic's opponent Offers him a draw, but he's completely losing after a very simple tactic. And yeah, this is repeated then shortly after in the game that we're uh, just about to see. Harman playing against the 1500, who plays bishop g4. And is then visibly pleased with himself after capturing uh, Harman's queen on g4. 
Before realizing after bishop e5 that his king is boxed in and checkmated, he gives up the queen <laughs> and then offers a draw, which is ridiculous. He's mating one. Do you want a draw? No. Okay then. <laughs> which is, uh, yeah, both of these draw offers are kind of ridiculous, to be honest. But on we go. Our hero is still undefeated. And now she's getting ready to meet the big guns. So she plays against Towns, the guy she met earlier in the episode. And the registration guys tell her that she doesn't have a chance against those guys and he is underrated. But we'll see. The game starts off with the Scandi. Shout out to Team Scandi. She plays it as a gambit. He takes on c6. Notice he captures quite fluently like a normal chess player. A good chess player. And we get this position. Take a good look at this position because we go forward in time and notice the knight on g4 and notice especially the pawn on d6 the knight on g4 it's very hard to get there and it must be the last move because it attacks the queen but there was a pawn on d6 unfortunately the position before there's no way to get the pawn to d6 so the position in the middle game literally could not have been reached from the position we had from the opening another uh, small mistake follows as there are eight pawns on the sidelines and one on the board which makes nine doesn't make sense but they immediately make it up with a beautiful combination to end the game he takes a pawn on h6 and he seems to be doing well should be able to draw she attacks his rook rook doesn't have a lot of squares but he can go back and then a beautiful domination motif king to g6 and you notice that the rook can't move anywhere all the squares are covered and the red squares are covered by the knight fantastic stuff he circles her name as she has defeated him. A beautiful combination to end the game. And he compliments her. Uh, and well, she gives an excuse about wanting to look at the board a little more, which is, well, not something people do much. But Belchick awaits. But first, greasy hair guy. We don't see that game. So uh, it's time for the final showdown. Harmon against Belchick. We start off with a Karakan. Somehow that seems to rattle her, uh, which is strange because she has read basically modern chess opening from, uh, yeah, from beginning to end several times. So we have this opening here and he starts to yawn, which was quite weird. I didn't really know what to make of that. And she reaches for the knight on c3, a small error as she has already played knight c3. When she reached for the knight, she was actually playing h3. So a small cutting mistake, but nothing big. The game goes on. Quiet developing uh, middle game here where uh, white goes for uh, an attack on the king side pushing her pawns forward and the tension in the scene is quite nice she takes up g6 here and as you see on the board and he recaptures and now she goes to the toilet you can often find useful things on the toilet in this case he finds her uh, useful stockfish brain uh, ceiling calculation ability People go to the toilet during nor during a long tournament game, so nothing abnormal there. The game continues and the pressure starts to mount on the king side. Path starts to build up, bringing her rooks over to the king side and all of her pieces. She starts to break through, but the tension is still uh, very high with all the people uh, gathering around the board until she finds the move bishop to e6. Here they start talking, which is uh, another movie thing that doesn't really happen that much uh, in real life. She says, you can't get out of it. He gives her a check, she blocks with the bishop, and we have knight takes g6. The, the rook lands on f7. The king escapes to h6, but now comes the death blow. Queen takes g6, a fantastic combination. The combination is so good that Beltic needs the moment to, uh, to realize what's going on, but he's getting checkmated as I'm showing you on the board. Rook f5, king back, another rook check, and then checks on h file, g file, and bishop f5 checkmate. You see him tip his king over. This is another pet peeve. People don't do that. People say I resign or just, you know, bring their hand forward. They don't tip the king over. This is sort of a movie thing that has become the norm, but we see him applaud her, which is quite nice. What was also nice was the final game and the final combination. I can tell you that with the black pieces in the game was uh, Genrik Kasparian, one of the best known uh, chess composers in the world, and his opponent. 
none other than Rashid Nesmetdinov, a legendary, magical, almost mystical fi figure in the history of chess. A player with great natural ability and great attacking prowess. Now why is this important? Well, his parents died when he was very young. Sounds familiar? It does. He had great natural talent. Sound familiar? He learned chess by watching others play at a chess club. Well, she played against Scheibel and, and learned by herself. And at 15 he played in Kazan's Tournament of Pioneers, winning all 15 games. Meanwhile, Beth won the Kentucky State Championship, winning all of her games. Coincidence? I don't think so. I don't know, but I don't think so. Tell me what you think. And also, tell me how you liked the episode, and how did you like the chess in the episode. I will hopefully see you soon in a future episode from The Queen's Gambit. I like this show, and I can't wait to finish it off. I'll see you later, guys. Bye-bye.